we need people, I think, who have a sense as to how masculinity works and what, the, what some of the traps of that are in our culture. So the more, um, and I probably should have covered this earlier, but to digress a tiny bit, the more traditionally um, masculine a guy is, the less he's likely to question that there's any choice about that stuff. It will just seem kind of natural and, well, everyone's like, you know, this way except for the weirdos. Um, and that takes away choices that a man might have. Um, if part of that model requires him to be strong and fearless and brave and not have strong feelings, it's going to be really difficult for him to work through the results of his trauma. So part of what we do is to at least expose some of the limitations of, you know, of the, the, the normal way that we do masculinity in this culture so that the guy at least has a chance to make some different choices if, if that's what's going to work for him. He can take the good bits and sometimes be free from some of the worst bits. So an understanding of that sort of thinking is also really useful, I think. Men are generally abused by men. And so men who have been sexually abused as children face two taboos. The first taboo is childhood sexual abuse. And the second taboo for many men still is same-sex same sex, sex. So it brings in question for men, for many men, their sexuality. And one of the comments that I'll often hear men make is, but I'm not gay, even though they've been involved in these, you know, being abused by a male perpetrator. And so a lot of focus is spent on talking about sexuality, masculinity, and differentiating, differentiating the different, it's different between pedophilia and, and, and homosexuality, identifying having conversations about because they're very different. So that's, a, that's an area that's different, I think, than it is for female uh, victims of childhood sexual abuse, because it's often a male perpetrator there rather than a, it's a different sex rather than same sex. Um, and I think the third area is, it's about agency. In our culture, men or males are, uh, are often identified, mostly identified as the active ones, the ones that um, initiate, the ones that are powerful, the ones who are in charge. And it doesn't mean that all men operate in a overbearing or, 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 pow or uh, a powerful abusing way. But that's, those are the messages to men in our community. Most action heroes are male. You know, it's, that's, that's the context. And so for many men, the sense of powerlessness is so strong. As an, an adult male, of oh, this is what happened to me as a child. I was abused by another male, but as an adolescent male, I felt powerless. And I think that has a huge impact upon identity, not only sexual identity, but personal identity and masculinity as a male. I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to help people to find their own sense of masculinity, um, that, that it's there are such strong messages about what it means to be a male, just as there are very strong messages about what it means to be a female within our community. And so that can be challenging to kind of help someone to get to some place of self-acceptance and to redefine their masculinity in a way that means something to them, that means they don't have to be... Um, uh, ashamed of aspects of their personality which which you know they, they this has happened with a couple of men I'm working with recently actually where where they 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 have a sense of shame that they were into more non-traditional kinds of activities as boys um, and and they question whether or not that kind of let gave other people the idea that they were weak and that they were vulnerable because they were around the arts and you know, they were interested in music and one of them was interested in, in playing instruments and the other was interested in dance. And because there is this kind of mythology around the, the, the strong man, they wonder whether they contributed in some ways to their own sexual assault by being seen as not that person. So that's a really tricky one to negotiate and things things like sexuality is really difficult to negotiate too because if, if they've... Um, had a bodily response to being sexually assaulted, which, you know, we, we know our bodies respond physiologically to touch. So if they've got an erection or if they've ejaculated during sexual assault as a little boy, that's really confusing for them to kind of process that. Does that mean I'm gay? 
does that mean I, I did contribute to it? Does it mean I wanted it? Um, but it feels yucky at the same time and I feel ashamed. And so, you know, sorting through, I think for anybody who's been sexually assaulted, there are a myriad of emotional impacts and psychological impacts and, and self-blame and shame are, are prevalent for women too. But th those other layers for men are, are around questioning their sexuality because often their first sexual experience has been with a male and also uh, questioning their masculinity. And those those two can be difficult kind of to, to work through in a way where they come out the other side feeling like, I'm okay as I am. And, and that was, that was someone perpetrated a crime against me. We do come very much from that kind of um, framework and, you know, understanding it very much as a crime, locating the responsibility with the offender. But you have to delve into the reasons why they feel like it, it has been their responsibility because we can't just shift it by saying, no, it wasn't your fault. If that's what they're feeling, we have to kind of work with that, yeah. The man might be aware that there'd be questions raised about sexuality, about, you know, if he was subjected to sexual abuse, does that mean he, he is gay or that he wanted that to happen or, or has that experience altered his sexuality? Um, particularly, and I think for men that's, that's particularly challenging where there's been some kind of, you know, sexual arousal or, or physiological pleasure felt as, as uh, just on a purely physical level, whether that's developing an erection or ejaculating during the abuse, there's, it creates, it creates a lot of complexity around the man's own understanding of how that's, how that's relates to his sexuality and what other people might think that says about his sexuality. So being able to decouple and unpack the, the physiological responses that the man has had from his own sense of identity and his own sense of preference, I think is really important work. I think it's essential to have done some thinking around the way we do gender, around how that uh, impacts upon men's experience of the world in general in day-to-day -day life and their sense of self, uh, but also specifically how that either gets in the way of or facilitates certain kinds of understandings about the experience of sexual abuse. Um, you know, for example, stories about, you know, an example would be m m the idea that men a should admit to having any difficulties and if they do they should be able to deal with those difficulties themselves and I think so being able to unpack those ideas with men a little bit and, and frame them in terms of a cultural story or a social story rather than a, a personal deficiency. I think probably most important for me is a, a framework that I hold around you know the jargon term would be a socially constructed um, definition of what it means to be a man and gender. And what I mean by that is the ways that men learn in any given culture, and particularly the culture that we live in, because that's where I work, um, how to be a man, what it means to be a man. And I guess the ways that we can work with that in a creative way, and, and also the constraints that that has for some of the men that we work with. Um, I was actually just working with someone this week who was um, saying, you know, interesting comments, he's saying, in my head I know it's okay to cry, but there's all that those messages that I've had since I was a child saying, you're weak, there's something wrong with you, and therefore I don't let myself, and even, come, even you know, I've been anxious all day about coming and talking about this stuff because I might do something unmanly. I mean, just unpacking that language. Um, and not in, a, not in a particularly academic way with clients, but just exploring what all that stuff means and, and what it means to them and where they learnt it and ways of unlearning and learning new things. That, that, those concepts for me are, are, are probably, whether I talk about them explicitly or not, the people I'm working with, they're guiding the way I'm thinking about what we're talking about. And I suppose that's one of the things for me is having come from that view where gender analysis was very strong because I worked in the area of domestic violence and, se and sexual assault. 
to see uh, men understand that gender plays a very important part in men's lives, how we live our lives, uh, decisions we make, how we act to behave in different situations, um, and then to understand then that that comes together and influences uh, uh, men's and women's responses to sexual assault and their experience of sexual assault. And so it'd be very difficult for me to kind of understand or work in this area in a kind of decontextualised way. Um, I think you can get into victim blaming if you do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I couldn't even comprehend how I would do it without taking into consideration how, you know, an abuse happened in a certain context because maybe there's more boys or girls in that context, um, that people's responses to that, the, what resources that was avail were available to them. Um, I couldn't understand, couldn't kind of comprehend doing that work with I didn't have that gen strong gender analysis. Um, and that's not a kind of battle between men and women or anything, like that's a strong kind of understanding of people's context and gender in their lives. Um, and having said that also, is, um, one of the kind of prime um, ways of I orient myself to the work is to understand sexual abuse and sexual assault is about taking away of choice, either by power or force, uh, but also by m having greater knowledge maybe at, at certain age, uh, uh, by or you know somebody being having um, greater physical power or presence, uh, or being able to manipulate a certain certain situation. So if I understand abuse is taking away of choice, then my job is to provide choice. It's not to tell people what to do, it's to look at the options that are available for them, uh, provide them with information. Um, and I think that's probably a very, very strong orienting um, kind of process for me. If I'm sitting there to think about the choices that are available either for the person at the time, but also now, and so I'm not framing any of my conversations or questions in a way other than one of opening up choice to look at possibilities, um, to look how um, choices were closed down at certain times and how then we might uh, do something different from that. Because if, if to not do that um, means I can replicate the same pattern of behaviour um, which has that whole feeling of abuse, of manipulation, of somebody else knowing better or telling somebody or dictating how somebody might act. I think people need to be wise and, and experienced in working with people and in services um, where they take on a large view of society and have a good understanding of what's happening in our society around us and discuss that with their colleagues. Gender analysis is important, understanding what happens in terms of our society. Many of us as women have grown up in process of great change but what I've come to understand is that for men in our society the stereotypes have very little changed and so coming to the work with men is also to appreciate and stand in a man's shoes and as a woman working in this area is to understand how men, even modern men in, in urban society, see themselves and the stereotypes and the pressures that puts on, on men in coping with trauma and the things that have happened to them. There hasn't been as much change for men, I believe, as for women. I think the dynamics of power and control in our society are incredibly important to understand because both at a, at a meta level and what happens, and a lot of work has been done around that in terms of power and control, but how it breaks down to in, in the ingredients of sexual abuse. It's being exposed much more now in the media, but it's been an ingredient there. So to understand not only the big issues and the very obvious issues about institutions or adults versus children, but the subtleties of power and control and what has happened to families and what has happened to children. Um, or what happens to adults in their heads if they've had a recent assault too. Uh, it's understanding those subtleties, uh, the key to working, I think, with individuals and being able to meet them in their individual way. Um, Issues of sexuality, I think, are another key concept. Um, overall, society is much more accepting of a range of different sexual choices for people these days. But internally, that's very difficult for a lot of people. And for men, I think it's been very difficult, especially if people have suffered sexual abuse or sexual assault. And perhaps, for instance, they're straight, but they've 
had an experience by the same gender person who was the perpetrator. The confusion and the difficulty, um, internal and external thinking and what, that, what it means about them, even if they are a very accepting, broad-minded person. So the, it, the conflicts that, that can be around that in our society are, are very difficult for men still. Women too, but men especially. And, and I think my feminist theory also applies equally well because that does look at um, power imbalance to know something about something about the the politics of power is is really helpful in that work um, to a lesser extent I suppose understanding a little bit about attachment um, is really important too and identity the, the, the ways in which young boys identities are formed and how they get a belief about their masculinity because that's really one of the big things that's impacted particularly by childhood sexual assault for young men and old men. My main reason for being in this work is I have a very strong sense of social justice. That drives everything I do. Um, and I believe that if you, for people to work in this field, they need to have that. <laughs>